Tonight on Late Review, Tony Parsons, Jermaine Greer and Tom Paulin discuss Underage Outrage in the remake of Lolita, Jeffrey Archer's latest and possibly last novel, the BBC's alleged fear of the truth in Stephen Polyakov's new play, and journeys into space in the sculptures of Anish Kapoor. The arguments begin in Late Review, live at 11.15. Now on BBC Two, Jeremy Paxman with Newsnight. The Church of England crowned the Queen. Now one of its senior members says instead of the mystery and flummery of coronation, the monarch ought to be elected. Time for Elizabeth the last. The present system of choosing a king or queen is an anachronistic lottery which perhaps can't be left as it is. The proposal from a former chaplain to the queen is that in future the monarch might be elected. As the queen undertakes yet another attempt to burnish the image of the royal family and make it seem more part of contemporary life, is an end to automatic succession something we should take seriously? I'll be asking the cleric who produced the idea whether he's suggesting Charles isn't fit to be king. They've been counting the votes in the local elections across England for an hour and a half now and in the referendum on whether London needs a mayor. Early indications appear to show the Tory comeback hasn't yet started. You'll be thrilled to hear Peter Snow is back with his computer. <laughs> well, I think the main thrills will be a bit later on, Jeremy, but the initial indications we do have are that the changes on the local elections, when these seats were last fought all over the country except in Scotland and Wales and many parts of England, uh, is that the Labour Party are down 4% and what for them was a very good election, the Tories up 4% and what for them was a very bad election. Doesn't necessarily mean to say the Tories are going to stage a nationwide recovery, but better than they were before. That'll see councillors changing uh, from Labour. So expect to see some Tory gains this time uh, and the Liberal Democrats down just 1%. We hope to have a clear pattern of the national vote in just a few minutes' time, Jeremy. Also tonight, it's taken a year and a half, but at last, today, the inquiry into child abuse at children's homes in North Wales is over. Will it shed any light on why the abuse was allowed to continue for so long? Being scared as an adult on your own and vulnerable is, is difficult enough to face sometimes. But as a child, it's, it's almost, it's, for me anyway, it's almost, I can't describe how I felt. I just knew that I was changing and I would have done anything to get away from that. Buckingham Palace is in the midst of a public relations campaign to improve the popularity of the royal family. Tonight's suggestion from one of the Queen's spiritual guides is that it might be the best way they can ensure their popularity would be to put themselves up for election. Can a mere accident of birth produce a man or woman fit for the job? It's the sort of remark which might once have meant a spell in the tower because it overturns the whole principle on which a monarchy operates. If any place embodies the close relationship between the British Crown and the English Church, it is Westminster Abbey, scene of coronations, solemn funerals and royal weddings. Yet it was here tonight that one of the Anglican clergymen closest to the present Queen advocated something quite astonishing. Canon Eric James, chaplain to the Queen for 14 years and close spiritual advisor, thinks it's time to end the hereditary right of succession of Europe's oldest royal family. In a special lecture delivered tonight, the canon said it was time for radical thought. The problem of hereditary monarchy is obvious and simple. The monarch now may be above reproach, but you can never tell what you're going to get. And there's not a lot to be said for such a lottery. My lord's pray be seated. The canon believes that Tony Blair's plans to remove political powers from hereditary peers in the House of Lords is a natural cue for a wider, more sweeping reform of our whole constitutional structure. There is surely a certain illogicality, even naivety, in thinking you can raise, as a matter of principle, the question of hereditary peers of the realm 
but think you can leave entirely undisturbed the question of the hereditary monarchy. So what does the Queen's chaplain have in mind for his boss? Not so much off with her head, but on with a commission to look at the introduction of an elected monarch and the separation of church from crown. Are these just the seditious thoughts of a loose cannon, or do they have wider support? Some parts do at least. I have forever, as long as I can remember, supported the establishment of the church. I've recently changed my mind completely and believe it must be, we must get rid of it. Um, two main reasons. One was um, the, um, the oath which bishops have to take, which has just been discovered, was secret, uh, where they um, give their allegiance to a queen who is in all things spiritual and ecclesiastical as well as temporal, the supreme governor of the church. That is not right. But the canon's going much further, playing on the unease beneath the mourning for the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. Even Buckingham Palace recognised uneasily the dangers of estrangement from public affection. Could an elected king or queen rekindle popular support? I think there's a concern in royal circles that the Queen and the royal family may have lost touch, lost confidence with the British people. So this may be a way of reconnecting them. They, they feel bad over the, the way they handle the death of Diana. There's a concern about the reaction to the fire at Windsor, to the Queen paying tax. This could be a way of, if you like, creating a new legitimacy for the monarch. It may not work, but that may be the idea. Such a knife! The canon looks to history and Shakespeare for his inspiration. There he finds the model for our future monarchs, King Lear, who learned to understand his people by suffering among them as an outcast. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, but bide the pelting of this pitiless storm. Instead of the blasted heath, the Queen and Prince Philip have spin doctors. Today they were trying to demonstrate the palace's green credentials by the Queen taking her first ever trip in a taxi this one powered by liquid gas. Will events like this, or the trumpeted trip to a pub, bring about a people's monarchy? It's kind of dawned on them that the game is up as far as the old traditions are concerned, and they need to find some new way of throwing the old baggage overboard and connecting themselves with some kind of popular uh, opinion. And I think many of them seem to have decided that they'll do it Di's way. Uh, and try to create some kind of touchy-feely image for the church and for the royal family. And I think the, the canon's proposals for an elected monarchy are a rather desperate attempt to kind of uh, create that more popular people's image. Queen Elizabeth the last, as Canon James is suggesting she might be, got her job by accident of birth. An elected monarch would certainly have popular support. But would an elected monarch be a monarch at all? Well, there's in the studio now Professor Stephen Hazler, who's chairman of the Republican Society, the Bishop of St Albans, the Right Reverend Christopher Herbert, and uh, Canon Eric James, who uh, made this, uh, these proposals tonight, or suggestions. How could a monarch be elected and still be a monarch? Well, I want to start off by saying that this programme began by saying that I said the monarch ought to be elected. It amazes me that the media can't take seriously a script and, and, and make it thoughtful. I said maybe... It, the monarch ought to be elected, but I put this amongst a series of serious thoughts, and this is a parody. Well, you of what also I suggest the monarch ought to be able to abdicate if they don't yes, fancy the job yes, before yes, they have to take right. it on. That's you say explicitly, neither can things be left just as they are. Yes, I do. You say the question needs to be asked uh, in whether the mere accident of birth can ever now be expected to produce a man or woman fit for the role that royalty requires. Yes, but I didn't it say does. it ought to be elected. No, you suggest that it is one of the things that ought to be considered, yes. that we ought to but go back to the last Why start a programme by saying that I said that the monarch ought to be elected, and that's precisely what I didn't say. You don't think the monarch should be elected? No, I didn't I'd say it, that's one possibility. Well, why are you suggesting it? Because the, we've, got to, we've got to think profoundly about what the, what the head of state should be in the future. And this is one possibility. But it's, it's, it is silly to, to, to parody something when there is a, a profound idea to be grappled with. And the profound idea that you're suggesting we grapple with is, quote, maybe the time is, retu is returning yes. for election to the task yes. and role maybe. of monarch. Maybe is a very important word in Fine. the English okay. language. Well, now we're clear you're not saying definitely that it should, should happen. You, you are suggesting that it might happen. Thank you. Can an elected monarch 
be a, a monarch in the true sense of the word, because surely the whole principle of monarchy is that it is inherited. Not at all. No, that the monarchs were elected in 1210, um, monarchs were elected. I say that in the script. Yes, you do. It's rather a long time ago. Yes, but uh, <laughs> age-old wisdom. Isn't the principle, though, of a monarchy that uh, you get uh, the good with the bad as child succeeds parent? W well, Bagot, the great um, man on the Constitution, said that in 1802, all the monarchs of Europe uh, were, were insane. Um, and I think that it, 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 in the, the whole history of monarchy is a very strange thing. What's that got to do with it? Well, you never know whether you're going to get an insane monarch or a marvellous one. Do you think we're I'm on saying the edge of some insanity well, in the monarchy? No, I'm saying we've had a marvellous monarch for the last few years and the last, last generation. And I think it's very important, but it's, it's the luck right. of the draw. Fine. Stephen Hazel, do you think if we're, this idea did you, of an elected monarch, is such a thing feasible? No, an elected, the President of the United States is an elected monarch. The President of France is an elected monarch. The minute you go over to a system whereby you say that the person who ought to represent the country should be elected, you really are breaking with a major tradition in this country. I accept way back it was not like this, but a major tradition that the eldest son, and by the way, the eldest son, mm -hmm. uh, should become the representative and head of state of a country. That's a major change, uh, it, it, and I don't know why the canon is getting so worried about this. I mean, he's stating something which is going to grow. This idea that we can enter the 21st century with not, without raising the question that the head of state of Britain uh, should be from amongst us, should be democratically elected. There's nothing unusual about that or revolutionary about that. Most countries do it already. So you think it's a helpful contribution? I think it's a helpful contribution and I think it's the kind of contribution but we're increasingly going to get as we get nearer the millennium. But do you think it's a Republican contribution? Of course it's a Republican cons Of course it's a Republican principle right. that no. anybody should be able to become head of state if they're elected. Now, Bishop, what do you think of the proposal that uh, we might consider electing a monarch? I, I, I don't see it has much future, to be honest, because I don't see the relationship between election and monarchy unless we go to the next stage, which is to say we'll have a, a president, we then have a republic. I don't believe that that is what this nation wants or would desire to have a republic. Um, reason for that, I think the monarchy has worked and evolved well, extremely well over the centuries and if things ain't broke then we don't fix it and I hope that all this stuff about spin doctoring uh, which was on the, the lead film will just be treated for what it is which is just thin and superficial comment about something which is far more serious than talk of spin would ever uh, have us believe. Uh, so, uh, do you, uh, are you prepared to withdraw your suggestion? No, I'm not, because I think there are several things which have come together at the moment which suggest that um, a change is going to happen. I think that, first of all, the, um, what's happened in Australia, the way they mm. have thought out things mm. and um, have a different attitude to the monarchy. Moving into Europe means that we are getting right. closer to different models of monarchy. Um, the Commonwealth itself um, has various suggestions in it. I think that um, the, the media has made an enormous difference to uh, monarchy, the whole, um, the whole way in which the media dominates. Do you the, think uh, that Prince Charles isn't up to the job? I think he's done marvellously, but I think it's going to be very, very difficult for Prince William to be um, educated when the, mm. uh, and, and, and married when the, when the media is so concentrating upon his life the whole time. I think the media is almost destroying uh, mm. the capacity for educating a person, the private and public life. Bishop, uh, do, uh, do you uh, think uh, that there is no uh, case for change at all? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the monarchy and this country have evolved. And that has been the, the way this country has operated, which is why we haven't had a civil war for so long. And no doubt the monarchy will continue to evolve. Um, but I hope that um, all the talk of, of, of spin and getting the image right will gradually be abandoned because I think the people see through that. They associate that with uh, mm. Well, uh, that's a comment you ought to address to Buck Buckingham Palace uh, rather than anybody else. Maybe, but it was on the lead film, so I thought it was worth making that point. Right. If you look through a, woman, a, w a week of women's magazines and look at how royalty figures, it is sick-making. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it's very, very important that we should see that this is the way the media handles royalty these days. Yes, yeah, so the media does, simply reflects a public interest in this. And the problem with Buckingham Palace is they've played up this personal aspect of their lives. 
you remember Charles and Diana's wedding was played up, wasn't it, as the love match of the century by Buckingham Palace. And so those who wield the sword die by the sword. We cannot, we cannot uh, let the monarchy get away with this. They played up the media. They played to the media. They turned themselves into a media monarchy, and the media has destroyed them. They've, they've run into this problem themselves, in my view. Okay, well, let's leave aside that question for a moment. The other thing that you're suggesting be seriously considered is the question of disestablishment. Mm. Well, I'm suggesting that the establishment needs to be looked at. I'm not saying disestablishment. I think the nature of the establishment needs to, needs to be looked at very carefully. Right. Uh, well, Bishop, do you think there's any chance that this uh, commission that the canon here is suggesting, the Archbishop's Commission, looking at that and coming to the conclusion the Church of England ought to be disestablished? No, I, I, at the moment I don't think there's any pressure anywhere for the Church to be looking at its uh, relationship with the state. Uh, my own view is that I believe the Church of England should remain established. I believe we have a major contribution and continue to make a major contribution to the life of this nation. But, but, but why should bishops, unelected bishops, I, I mean you're a fine fellow, I know that, but why should unelected bishops sit in the upper house okay. of a legislature yeah. and determine the laws, determine the laws over which we, we have to live? I mean, You'll this allow is me a, to reply, is, won't you? Well, I certainly yeah. will, but isn't okay. it fundamentally undemocratic that, that, that a bishop should, uh, who I all. cannot elect, not who at you all. cannot elect, not at all. should determine the laws no, which that's we true have. of the whole of the House of Lords. Of course it's true of the whole of the House of Lords. Well, let the fact, okay, let the bishop let the justify his position. Right. Yeah. Let's start by saying that I think bishops uh, are in, as much in touch, more in touch, with more layers of society than most other people in this country, including academics, if I may say so. Well, I'm not sitting uh, in the but, house but, No, of course not, uh, because you're not so much in touch with society as some bishops are. Ah, and what, ah. I, what I want to suggest is that uh, because we're a, a still a, an overtly a Christian country, an implicitly a Christian country, and because vast numbers of people um, are, are baptized, are members of the churches... But you'd want other then, churches than the course, Church of England, of and you'd want would. other faiths to... Of course, course I would. No, of All course right. I would want that to we're, happen. We're going to leave it there yeah. because we have to uh, take up the story of the local elections because it's a year to the day since the landslide which swept 18 years of Conservative rule into history. Today was the first big chance to measure whether the love affair with Labour is as strong as ever. Local elections in England today gave about half the electorate the chance to vote, and in London, the opportunity to decide whether to go for an elected mayor. The polls closed at 9 o'clock. Peter Snow is down in Westminster playing with his computer, which we hope can reveal what voting patterns are beginning to emerge. Peter. Well, Jeremy, I hope so too. We do have a picture now of the changes from the local election 94, a little bit different from the one we talked about earlier. Labour look like they're down 3% on those very good elections for them in 94. Tories up 4% of what for them were terrible elections, so expect to see council has been gained by the Tories. 2% down the Liberal Democrats and 1% up the others. Of course, the key figure we're after is what the pattern of national support is for the parties. And now we can make our first stab at estimating the projected national share. And here it is, the Labour Party on 39%, way below what they are in the polls, below what they were in the general election. 31% the Conservatives, exactly what they were in the general election, 25% the Liberal Democrats, and 5% the others. Look at that now against the background of recent contests, going right back to the 94 elections. There we have the two Liberal Democrats and the Tories down here with the Labour Party up there. And so the pattern goes on right the way through the uh, general election of 97, through the local elections of 97 on the same day as the general election until you get to today. Now look at Labour right the way up the top there, but dropping back at the end here in this local election to 39% right over here. 44% in the general election. The Tories, look, they're better than they have been in recent local elections at 31%, but they're still on that level they were at that disastrous defeat in the general election. And the Liberal Democrats, going right down there to 17% in the general election, up in the local elections, 26% last year, and holding that local election record they tend to find in the mid-20s here at the end. So Liberal Democrats doing all right, but they tend to do all right in local elections. And one result in that referendum you mentioned, Jeremy, the City of London has gone green for yes to a mayor and an assembly. And what we do is we tot up the votes using Tower Bridge as a measure. Yes over here, the green votes over here for yes. Just 977. City of London, tiny electorate, 5,000 people. Turnout, very small, 31% of the City of London. 574 no, that is 63 to 37. Quite a substantial no, if that were the pattern throughout, a bigger no than many people expect, Jeremy. Thank you, Peter. Well, let's go now to uh, some of the counts around the country. We'll go first to Martha Carney up near uh, Manchester. Uh, Martha, that's a Labour councillor. Are they going to hang on to it? Well, at the moment, we've had just half of the results in. 
and it seems that there haven't been any Conservative gains on an extremely low turnout, which the Tories are interpreting as rather bad news for them. And the thing about Trafford is that it is a Tory heartland. It was the last Tory Metropolitan Council. So if they're going to stand any chance of staging a national recovery, then that's where you'd expect to see any results. But uh, it doesn't seem as if they're doing any of that so far. Tony Blair himself was up here last week, seems to have made a big impact. Uh, Tory canvassers were saying that even when they went up to see big houses with Jaguars in the driveway, people there were saying, oh, I'm going to vote for Tony Blair. And the Conservatives are worried that people have been voting on the national picture. So, right. um, but it is a low turnout, uh, so we could see some pretty volatile results. Martha, thank you. Well, it seems to be a slightly different story in Sheffield, where Labour's council leader has lost his seat to the Liberal Democrats. Sue Cameron's there. Sue. Uh, well, as you say, it's proving a very uh, bad night uh, for Labour. People have gathered here in the town hall in Sheffield and the Liberal Democrats are doing really well. They've now won five seats, which is more than they uh, expected uh, to win. Uh, there seems to be quite a lot of dissatisfaction with uh, old Labour. Sheffield has been Labour almost for as long as anyone can care to remember. So the Liberal Democrats are pushing very hard. Dissatisfaction here over debt levels, services are being cut back, and old Labour really does seem to have done um, rather uh, badly. And there is a feeling perhaps that uh, the honeymoon with uh, Tony Blair might still be going on in the South, but up here with old Labour, it uh, does seem to be over. And uh, as you Sweet. said, the Labour leader has lost his, uh, has lost his seat. Sue, thank you very much. Well, let's uh, cross now to Hugh Edwards, who's down at Conservative uh, Central Office. What's the mood down there, Hugh? Well, Jeremy, the intriguing question here tonight in Smith Square is what do the Tories back there in Central Office privately expect they will do tonight? Well, it's been a little difficult to get a figure out of them, but I have got a figure from one well-placed source, and he told me a couple of hours ago at that stage of their canvassing that they were expecting to make gains of around 250 seats. Now, two things I'd say about that, Jeremy. First of all, the line you'll get from Tories this evening very strongly is, look, especially in local government, we did so badly in 94, to be gaining seats anyway is good, and it's good for party morale. However, I would add another thing, Jeremy, to that figure, which is this. If it is in that region of 250, uh, it's very, very modest in terms of an advance. Certainly on last year's general election result, it will certainly prompt some further questions about the direction the party is taking under Mr Haig. But we've only got a few hours to find out to see whether, by their own reckoning, they're making any advance Hugh. at all. Jeremy. Hugh, thanks very much. Um, let's uh, chew the fat now with uh, our uh, analyst, uh, Peter Kellner. Um, 250 seats, apparently, the Tories are hoping to gain. Is that the start of a comeback? I think the important news we've had in so far, which I think rather swamps, whether it's 200, 150 or whatever, is the incredibly low turnout. On the results we've had in so far, rather less than 30% of the people with the rights to vote have so far voted. And I think that's going to make us all rather cautious about how we interpret um, the, the people who have voted, because they're clearly... Uh, many okay. more people than normal have stayed at home. We normally expect 40% turnout, it's under 30%. The other big uh, vote today, of course, was a referendum on whether London should have a mayor. If the turnout in that is 30%, what kind of a mandate is that? All the parties were telling people to vote yes. Well, that's right, Jeremy. If I were the Prime Minister, the City of London's a tiny part. There's one bit of good news for him, there's one bit of bad news. The good news is there was a two-to-one vote, almost, for yes. And the feeling was, I think, that if any part of London was going to vote no, it was going to be the city of London because of its own peculiarities, traditions and jealousies. On the other hand, as you say, that 31% turnout means if you get that across London, even if you get a huge yes majority, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, I think the joy will be rather um, confined by the fact that so many more Londoners have stayed at home Not and voted either yes or no. Not a ringing endorsement. Not a ringing endorsement. Peter Kellner, thanks very much. Now, in a moment, why widespread physical and sexual abuse in children's homes across Wales went unchecked for 20 years. But before that, some of the day's other news. The man chosen to head the new European Central Bank has refused to confirm that he'll stand down early from the post. The appointment of Wim Doisenberg for, the, for, for a four, not an eight-year term, appeared to have been agreed last weekend. However, Mr Doisenberg today told the European Parliament that he wouldn't set a precise date for his retirement. The battle to win Rolls-Royce has been won, to no one's surprise, by a German company. However, Vickers, the owner of the luxury car makers, is selling it not to BMW, as expected, but to Volkswagen. £430 million has been offered for the firm. The longest and most expensive tribunal in British legal history ended today.
The Waterhouse Tribunal has spent the last year and a half examining allegations of sexual and physical abuse of children in care homes across North Wales, stretching back over a 20-year period. In his opening remarks, the Tribunal's barrister described the treatment of the children as, quote, bordering on wholesale exploitation, unquote. Those who say they were abused want the Tribunal report, due out by the autumn, to name names. Lawyers acting for the alleged abusers say their clients must remain anonymous. Roger Pinney of BBC Wales, who's covered the story from the outset, has this report. A small town tucked into the northeast corner of Wales. Eulo, a place you've probably never even heard of. But more than a year now, this has been the unlikely setting for a groundbreaking judicial inquiry. A blaze of worldwide publicity greeted its opening. There was the expectation of some lurid tales involving the great and good, but reporting restrictions imposed by the tribunal chairman put paid to that. And since this has largely been forgotten by all but the Welsh media, even so, week after week, the tribunal has been told of almost unimaginable exploitation of children in care. I was terrified of the man. I was more terrified of, of the physical abuse than the sexual abuse, because at least um, the, the member of staff was sexually abused me. He wasn't just always there after me all the time. Being scared as an adult on your own and vulnerable is, is difficult enough to face sometimes. But as a child, it's, it's almost, it's, for me anyway, it's almost, I can't describe how I felt. I just knew that I was changing and I would have done anything to get away from that. A series of prosecutions were to prove the catalyst for the inquiry. In the early 1990s, a string of abusers were jailed. Then there were the claims of a paedophile ring. Some household names were rumoured to have been involved. And a public outcry two years ago, when, on the advice of insurers, a local authority refused to publish a damning report. There was a fear it might stir up compensation claims. Questions were asked on the floor of the House. In the welter of claim and counterclaim, the tribunal was set up under the chairmanship of retired judge Sir Ronald Waterhouse. His remit to look at claims of abuse going back to 1974. In all, there have been some 700 separate allegations of abuse against 170 individuals and 39 homes. Day after day, they've come here and told their stories. There's a lot at stake. The trust of those who claim they were abused, the reputations of the accused. Now, as he prepares to write his final report, tribunal chairman must attempt to balance up those competing demands. At the centre of the inquiry, one home, Brynestin at Wrexham, until its closure in 1984, children from across Wales and beyond were housed here. It was at Brynestin that the paedophile Stephen Norris began his childcare career in North Wales. He's now coming to the end of a seven-year sentence for child abuse. The tribunal heard a statement from one of his victims. The words are read by an actor. I've never told anyone before about what happened to me with Mr Norris. And it has taken me a long time after the police first visited me to bring myself to talk about this. My wife doesn't know, neither do my parents. And when I think about what happened to me, it disgusts me. Peter Howarth was another member of Brunestin's staff jailed for sexually abusing children. He died last year in prison. These words are those of a man who says he was abused by Howarth. Again, they're spoken by an actor. This man has spoiled my life. He degraded me. And I feel that if I saw him now, I would kill him. Sometimes I feel that I'm not a man because of what happened to me. But I look at my children and I know I'm not gay. Howarth has damaged my adult life. Hundreds of files, thousands of pages of evidence many detailing allegations of horrific crimes against society's most vulnerable, children in care. One of the questions many hope the tribunal's final report will answer is who's to blame. Local councils, the Welsh office, the police, they've all been examined by the tribunal. In the case of the now abolished county of Clwyd, it was said the social services department operated within a culture of secrecy, although that was denied by those at the top. 
Time and again, witnesses, both staff and children, said they weren't listened to. It was put to Clewid's Director of Social Services at the time, Gledwin Jones, that all the ingredients of good childcare had been missing from his department. I still maintain there were a large number of caring staff in the department. Oh, and I don't take issue with that. But essentially, essentially, in terms of the individual child and his or her dealings with his or her problems, those ingredients were missing, weren't they? Yes. And that was a tragedy, as it turned out, for a large number of children. Yes. Not least because one of the effects of it was that the ground was made more fertile for those who were disposed to abuse physically and sexually. Yes. One tribunal witness says he can't understand how the abusers went undetected. As a victim of abuse, the man can't be identified under tribunal rules. We were warning to them when they come there, you know, and watch him if he comes to the bedroom at night. He does, doesn't it? Um, and the children used to freely speak about it, and I can't believe that other members of staff weren't aware of this man. They must have been there. If the children were aware of him, and we, was, we, we usually speak freely about it, um, it was almost a joke. It's not that I found it difficult to complain, I just felt that it was futile. A key question the tribunal would have to answer is whether or not the alleged abusers were in some way linked. Was there a paedophile ring, a loose network of child abusers, or were they just evil individuals acting alone? The tribunal's been told by its own leading barrister that evidence of a ring is not strong. Others, though, disagree. Mike Hames, former head of Scotland Yard's Obscene Publication Squad and now a child protection consultant, says the tribunal shouldn't adopt too strict a definition of what constitutes a paedophile ring. It's more like a spider's web, really, where people get to know each other through a variety of, of contacts, mainly, of course, around abusing children. Um, and they become part of a, a nationwide network. But if you, it's not something that you actually grab hold of. It's, not, it's, it's, it's quite amorphous, really. Private children's homes, as well as those controlled by local authorities, have featured at the inquiry but the stories of the abused have much in common. For some, an awful legacy of crime, drugs, even suicide. Many children's home residents have complained that they were denied even the most basic of educations, leaving care barely able to read or write. I'm extremely bitter that, that I've not been left, um, that I was not educated, because I, I believe now, having sort of basically the last four years started to ed educate myself, um, I, I have got a degree of intelligence and I believe there's a strong possibility that things would have turned out differently for me if they would have given me such things as career advice and maybe, hey, do you want to join the army? Anything really, just give me a purpose in my life. And then there's the cycle of abuse. Parents in Heighton have found it difficult to control their emotions. They're incensed that a convicted paedophile who they believe has threatened to re-offend could move into their area. The paedophile, Graham Seddon, had been a resident of the Bryn Allen Children's Home in North Wales. He was abused by the home's owner, John Allen. Abused was to turn abuser. Graham was the person that John Allen used to send into the dormitory to touch a young boy, somebody who's new, perhaps. And looking back now, when I saw Graham on the TV, and I saw what he'd been convicted of and, and, and his troubles, Yes, everything he's done is monstrous, but I raise the question, who or what made this monster? Alleged victims of abuse want the identities of all those implicated, Yulo, made public. So far, only those with convictions have been named outside the tribunal chamber. Their lawyers are determined to keep it that way. The chairman has even been threatened with a legal challenge, a judicial review. We ask the tribunal to indicate, if not today, then during the course of the next few days, its decision and the reasons for that decision as to whether or not it intends to name those individuals we represent, or any of them, as being guilty of criminal conduct. Why on earth should the tribunal accede to such a submission or request? Sir, I have to speak plainly in answer to your question. It may be that we would seek to review the decision of the tribunal to name people we represent as being guilty of criminal conduct. And once the report is published, that will be too late. But Sir Ronald Waterhouse has confirmed to Newsnight that he will identify the alleged abusers. As he left Yulo to write his report, he made his first public comment since the tribunal began. We are obviously going to have to name people who are prominent in the inquiry, 
because otherwise the public would be very dissatisfied because we're not going to brandish names about the place uh, indiscriminately. So you will be naming names? Yes, we will certainly be naming names and we will be setting out, we, we hope, a fair conclusion about the balance of the evidence that we've heard. Encouraging then from the point of view of the alleged victims, that leaves the prospect that if lawyers for the accused do press their case, Britain's longest and most expensive child abuse inquiry could yet end up before the High Court. Well, as you can see, the counting still going on in the local elections uh, in England. Mark Mardell, what's, uh, what do you hear about uh, turnout to start with? Uh, the turnout is extraordinarily low, and I think that's going to mean that we're going to see some quirky, odd results. In the districts, it's below 20%. In the metropolitans, it's below 30%. I, I suspect the reason is that we've actually got used to a climate where, at least for the last 10 years, people have been turning out in, in local elections and by-elections to give the Tories a kicking. Now, that's no longer happening. It doesn't mean they're particularly enthusiastic about what Labour's doing. But we're not seeing that syndrome of reacting to an unpopular government. So people are just not bothering, staying at home. What have you heard about uh, how the Conservatives are doing? Well, they're, they're certainly, as we saw on Peter Snow's polls, they're 4% up. That, that's obviously a good result for them. And they're going to, uh, in, in one sense, they're, you know, they're not going to be unhappy with that. And there are going to be some areas where they're gaining. But I think in the, in the long term, you know, over a year, we haven't seen them making the sort of gains that, that they would really hope for. There's no beginning of that, uh, that fight back. And uh, talking to people who've been out canvassing today and over the last few weeks, the, the Conservatives are really quite gloomy. One was saying it's not even a step-by-step -step getting back approach. Uh, one MP was, 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 was saying that, that really there's no sense out there at all that the Conservatives are doing anything right or that the government is particularly leaving many open goals. Mark right, Mardell, thank you. Well, we're joined now in the studio by uh, Christopher Chope of the Conservatives, Nick uh, Harvey of the Liberal Democrats and Hilary Armstrong of the uh, Labour Party, the government. Well, Christopher Chambers, is it hardly a ringing endorsement to your new leader, is it? Well, I think we're making good progress. I mean, I understand we've made some gains of, count of individual seats in councils already uh, from Labour and Liberal Democrats. And if we gain a significant number of seats this evening, uh, then that's obviously progress in the right direction. And for years, when we were in government, we used to explain away other parties gaining seats at our expense. <laughs> And in the end, we got to the stage where we are now. So we'll expect yeah. tonight that Liberal Democrats and Labour will try and explain away uh, their defeat. But it's obviously every council seat we win is a bonus. It's something we hadn't got before, and it's good news. But you were becoming more or less the political equivalent of the Flat Earth Society, weren't you? I mean, you're a third party in local government, scarcely the council under your well, name. Well, I, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, if you look at Wandsworth, for example, Wandsworth is a shining mm. beacon in local government. So is right. uh, Westminster. The ones that we control, we deliver really good quality services. Now, um, Hilary Armstrong, it's not hardly a ringing endorsement of your party either if the turnout is that low, is it? Oh, I'm very, very disappointed if the turnout is as low as, it, uh, as, as we are hearing. And what I do think is that that backs the modernisation programme that we have. We have been saying consistently that local democracy is nothing like as vibrant as it ought to be. Is it any wonder after it was end undermined? And we really have got to push forward the modernisation programme that puts the citizens much more in touch with their local council. Uh, and that we're determined mm. to do. And I think a low turnout will say very strongly that it's not going to be a moment too soon. Does that include giving local councils more meaningful powers? It does. On the, uh, that, that's what it means on one hand, and on the other hand, that they will be more accountable to their local electorate. Uh, well, I suppose for you it's uh, on to the uh, broad sunlit uplands, is it, as usual, when the Liberal Dems <laughs> appear on these programme local government? <laughs> well, we're defending from four years ago a very good performance, although Peter Snow was saying at the start of the programme it had been a good night for Labour, which it was. We were actually the big winners that night with three times as many gains as Labour. So on a very different political landscape now, our task is to try and defend the gains we made then. And if we succeed in defending a reasonable number of those, I think we'll take quite satisfaction from that. What, have you heard what's happening in Sheffield? Well, um, in Sheffield, I believe we have gained some seats, including the seat of the Labour leader, so obviously um, we will be pleased about that. I think there is a difference between the public perception of new Labour, as shown in the opinion polls, and the very different face of old Labour in some of the town halls. Now, the other thing, the other big vote today that was going on, particularly in London, mm. was this question of the mayor. All your parties, although uh, at least... Uh, Two of the parties only believed in half the proposition. Yeah. All of you went out and told people, vote yes to there being a mayor of London. 
and apparently only 30% of people turned out to vote at all, of whom perhaps there's a two-to-one majority in favour, we'll see. But, I mean, that means that the mayor has no legitimacy at all, doesn't it, Henry Armstrong? Oh, no, of course it doesn't, but I don't believe that in the rest of London the turnout will be as low as 30%. The only one that we've had is the City of London, and we always knew they were going to be most hostile, or at least least enthusiastic, about the Mayor. But it really is about time that, uh, as such an important city, the, you know, the capital, that we have yeah. well, something that can represent London, and yes. I think tonight you will see. Sure. People You've been telling will us that, though, for months, well, though, yes, haven't but you? And people part... don't appear to take taken sufficiently seriously to go and vote. I actually think, Jeremy, part of the problem is that there hasn't been disagreement. Uh, I think where there is a big contest, then you get a bigger turnout oh. and you get more interest in it. And that's part of our problem in government. If there have been two questions... Popular, if been too popular, that's the problem. Yeah, we're too popular. Oh. If there have been, <laughs> been two questions in the referendum, there would have been more interest in it. Yes. And if the referendum had been held on a separate day from the local elections, there would have been probably more interest in it. And if there have been two questions, we would have had the different parties able to articulate their different arguments in relation to whether they thought the mayor alone was the answer or whether they wanted an assembly. Well, there certainly should have been two questions. I mean, whether Londoners want back an assembly, I, I think, is pretty straightforward. The, London didn't want the GLC to go. They wanted authority back. But whether they should to vote for it. Whether they should vest so much power in one person is another issue. And I think the point is actually correct. If there had been a vigorous no campaign, that would have led to a, a more crackling debate and a bigger turnout. But with all three parties saying the same thing, it, frankly, it was a bit boring. Couldn't you also interpret a low turnout as great satisfaction with the government? I mean, we can all say it's ennui, it's the lack of interest in local politics, it's the fact that local councils have reduced powers and so on and so on and so on. But the fact is, people seem to be rather happy with what yeah. the government's doing. I well, know you'll say that. I want to ask you. <laughs> well, when, when, whenever there's a general election, and the, the year immediately after the general election, you normally get a lower turnout. Mm. And uh, that, when I was first elected to a council back in 1974, and the Labour government had just been elected, we had a very low turnout that year in, in London. And that, that, that's an essence. But I think the government will need to rethink the idea of having councils elected every uh, year on one third basis, because I think that is turning the electors off. And we'll see a higher turnout in London than we're seeing in the well, districts and uh, the Mets, where they have local elections every year. What's a Met? The yeah, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Authority. Authority. Oh, right. So sorry, yeah. yes. Nick Harvey, <laughs> do you think it amounts to an endorsement of the government? No, but I think Mark Nardell was right in saying that uh, in recent years people have turned out at local elections in order to kick the government, and it's clear from the national opinion poll ratings that that wouldn't be the case this time. I think mm. the Conservatives, though, who are looking to make 500 gains tonight, even to get back to where they were before the last round of these elections in the year that they threw Mrs Thatcher out, um, would expect people to be turning out and voting for them if that was really beginning to happen. Quick word. I think that uh, we would expect the Tories to be doing much better than they seem to be doing. We would expect the Liberals to be winning places like well, Sheffield if they were really it's coming it's back. It's 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 only a few weeks ago, we you were saying we were going to lose one spot and you were going to win it. This no, is new Labour we, no, we politics, didn't. Isn't it? This was, that was your prediction, and we said immediately okay. that's nonsense. Well, you, you lot can argue it through the night uh, for uh, aficionados among you. There'll be much, much more on the local election. And